Thank you so much, and thank you for having me. And I'm here to introduce Achillean in 10 minutes. Uh, but let's start somewhere completely different. So looking at this young man, he seems rather troubled, right? But he's in love, he's madly in love, and he's thinking about this night when there is a party and he's going to meet the subject of his passion. But he has a disease called eosinophilic esophagitis, so he has a hard time swallowing food. Even the tiny little piece scares him, because he's been at the emergency room where they have to pick out food and help him open up the esophagus. So eosinophilic esophagitis is a chronic disease. It's a lifetime disease. So most of you may not have heard of this one. It's a chronic inflammation in the esophagus. More than one in 2,000 are diagnosed with this disease, but it's a rather young one, so it was first described in the 1990s. It can start already when you're an infant, but most commonly it's around when you're in your 20s. And up till a couple of years ago, there was no particular treatment. Uh, the scientific background could be that it's a food allergy or some other allergy, or you have some kind of related disease. So at first you have to eliminate food, hard to do for the rest of your life. Then there are corticosteroids and PPIs. And just recently there was a biologic drug approved. So since then there is a diagnose, there is a well-defined disease, and now we can offer a treatment. So the number of patients are increasing fast. So, Achillean, how do we approach the eosinophilic esophagitis? Well, we looked a lot at this blockbuster dupixin. That's a biologic. This biologic is a bifunctional antibody. So this bifunctional antibody binds to two receptors and inhibits uh, messengers of inflammation, two cytokines. When we looked at that biology, we saw that, well, there are more cytokines that you probably need to block in order to uh, slow down the disease uh, or take away the symptoms. Because once first you get inflammation, then it progresses into strictures in the esophagus, and then it could be permanently fibrosis. So you need to discover early, and you have to dampen this inflammatory cascade. And then we saw that if we can use a small molecule, that would be beneficial as well, because the monoclonal is rather expensive, and you have to inject the pixent twice or every week, actually. And still, there is a lot of patients that do not respond to the monoclonal. So we saw a window of opportunity in an indication that do have a large unmet meat need, so there is room for some competition. And we focused on a well-known um, mode of action. So we've chosen to work with a JAK1 inhibitor. The new generation of YAK inhibitor has to be very selective, and this one is, and we call it AQ280. And looking at the business case then, there is one biologics, there are a few corticosteroid solutions, local acting and so forth, but there is still room for more, and there is still even an attractive business case if you look at only the depixent refractory patients and combine that with future um, Competition, it still looks rather interesting. So that's the base for us to start develop AQ280 into a drug for an aiming for the AOE patients. So what's the edge compared to what's already there? Well, if you have a very selective YAK1 inhibitor, you will not, like the former YAKs, now uh, having revenues around 20 billion US dollars in different kind of diseases, they had uh, some um, side effects that were not really wanted. So by increasing the selectivity towards YAK1, there are YAK2, YAK3, TIC2, you will have a better profile, but you will also have a larger therapeutic window. Compared to Dupixent, uh, there is, it's well known that the biologics, after time, the patients get resistant. So the effect of the biologics is getting lower and lower which is a bad thing if you have a chronic disease. Another thing that we have thought a lot about is onset of action. It takes time for the biologics, 
to actually make a difference for the AOA patients. We know that JAK inhibitors are rather quick, and that's been seen in atopic thermothitis, where you can compare these two mode of actions head to head. And then we had to think a little bit, because now we're coming with a pill, and I showed you before that this man, he doesn't want to swallow a pill, I, of course. So we're developing a JAK-1 inhibitor as an oral tablet that dissolves in your mouth or even in a glass of water. So that should be, and you take that once daily and there is no injections. Then you know in this room that COX for a small molecule versus biologics, there is a huge difference. And furthermore, if you're familiar with the Jack ones, now you will sit there and think, well, aren't there competition out there? Well, the first generation is still out there, but we know that for dupixent, if you take atopic dermatitis and you look how you treat patients there, dupixent is given once every second week. In AOA, they have to give it twice. AOA is a tough uh, disease, so by increasing the therapeutic window, we can go up in dosage compared to the traditional YAK1 inhibitors, and we think that that is a really a key thing to be successful with uh, a well-known mechanism action in a tough disease. So, so far we have uh, performed a phase one in healthy volunteers, where we saw that it was safe and tolerable. We could predict the dose and the PK looks really great. And you know, we all carry a little bit of inflammation inside. So even the students that participated in the phase one had a slight inflammation. And we can see by following the CXCL10, which is a biomarker for the mode of action of YAK1 inhibitors, that we can actually decrease uh, the amount of CXCL. This is just for us to have a sh show that there is signs of JAK1 inhibition. And we saw very little or no JAK2 uh, effects in the phase one. So now we are planning together with uh, KOLs that treat EOE patients daily, a phase two in Canada, US and five European countries. We have come so far, so the CMC is done, the regulatory preparations uh, is also uh, ready. And we hope to find the partner then, after phase two, that could change this patient's vision of his evening together uh, at the party. So that is basically Achillean. Achillean wants to work with inflammation, chronic inflammation and autoimmune diseases, because there are so many people affected by chronic inflammation their life span gets shortened, and the life quality of life is usually quite poor. And for the moment, we can't. We have looked a lot into the digestive system because there is a lot left to do uh, in that space. Achillean is a private company. We're focusing on T cell biology. If we go deeper in how we find our targets, we work as a team with a lot of experience from the pharma industry, but then we also work with CROs, CMOs, and experts globally, whoever can help us in our programs. And we have a few programs more than the AQ280. So this is our pipeline. I already talked about the first one. The second one is in the field of ulcerative colitis. Again, a different target and a different mode of action. And I don't know, if you know that if you think about ulcerative colitis, there are a lot of different treatments right now, but none of them have been able to keep the main clinical remission maintenance uh, below, uh, above 30%. So there is still a lot left to do. And then we have a really early program, PKC Theta, within the IBD space. And the Tech One program was the one program that we had partnered with Merck, and we now we have it in Achillean again and thinking about new partners for that program. So a lot of milestones, a lot to look forward to, and I will always get the question, can you finance such a big pipeline? Now I turn the light a little bit quickly. Well, it's difficult, right? So you have to think deal focused. That's what we do. We in license, we out license. We try to figure out if we can have collaboration partners or M&A activities. And if you're going to remember something from the talk today, please remember that I believe that we have a great team. We work with deal focus and we're phase two ready. Thank you so much.
Thank you, Sarah. So the first question for you is, are you looking to become a public company? Yeah, if there were a window, but there's not. <laughs> so as an entrepreneur, you have to think about something else then. Of course, if I could dream, I would love to build this pipeline a little bit further ahead and keep the 80 to 80 and the second program until there is a really good opportunity. Um, but I also believe that sometimes it's good that you cannot do as you first thought that you normally done. You have to think deal making, collaborations, and you prioritize your money. But of course, if it was a window, that would be one alternative for us. Okay, what would need to happen for there to be a window? Oh, that's the trickiest question, I Sorry. think. Yeah, you, I think we have to see that there's an appetite for risk in biotech companies again. I hope that one of the, no, no not one, a few of the Swedish listed company or public companies will make a success so that we can have success stories and we can accept some of them will be successful, otherwise will other will fail. And don't forget, 99% of all the attempts will never become a drug. Mm. Having striked a partnership with Big Pharma, Merck, before, how does this strengthen Aquilian in such activities? And I oh, love two two-part questions. And what did you take away from what happened? So, um, imagine starting a biotech with completely new innovative targets and say that and they're going to finance it. Uh, that's hard. Some laughed at me, of course. It's a difficult thing. But if you believe in science and innovation and a big pharma says, this is good, we want to have it already before you have a drug candidate, that gave us some confidence that we were doing things in the right way. Now, uh, coming to a point where the biology surprised us a little bit and didn't fit any longer with the strategic choices of our partner. You get it back. It's a little bit hurtful, but that's what happens. It's still a good target. We still benefit from 130 million to put in our Swedish crowns, to put in our pipeline. And that uh, I believe that was a good deal. Yeah. Do you also think that is a good uh, lesson to be learned there that you could share in, in the experiences for other people? Um, oh, there are so many lessons, but uh, I think that if we start to see the possibility to partnership both early, as in our case, where there is a long way to go, and later, it is a possibility to actually strengthen your whole pipeline, not only that program, and be patient. It took us oh, more than a year. So you can imagine how early we was when we first met Merck at the first time. We didn't have uh, that much data. And then we continue building data. And finally, uh, we got to know each other and the deal could be made. Excuse a poor, humble novice, but is a year really that long? Um, just talking. It feels like rather long when you're a small company, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, given the competitive landscape in inflammation and immune regulation, what differences you and your approach? So we, I think our approach is to, we focus on the T cells, okay? They drive inflammation in many different aspects. How can we stop it? And how can we stop it in different stages of inflammation? And we combine that by talking to Big Pharma every week, uh, finding out what's their next preferred target. How can we help? What's the data they're missing? So it's business intelligence, it's innovation, and we're not afraid of not working with the same platform. We choose target, we match it with an indication and with Big Pharma. And I think most of the biotech companies do so. So I, I think my team and the early approach of business development differentiate us in the beginning. And that's why we got the Merck deal. Thank you so much for your presentation. Sara Fredriksson, everyone from Aquilian.